Chris, good morning. Um, morning, Joe. If you could take a moment just to introduce yourself, uh, and then we can spend some time discussing the low carbon future of the marine marine industry. Yeah, of course, no problems at all. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Dunn. As you know, I'm a naval architect. I uh, have been a naval architect for the last 25 odd years, working in the west of Scotland, mostly in shipyards um, with a few consultancy uh, um, um, episodes. Um, but but, but uh, in the shipbuild industry, very much so. But in the last few years, particularly focused on new technologies, marine fuels of the future, um, trying to do a little bit on sustainability and uh, progressing our industry towards an, uh, a green environmental future. Okay, no, that, that's great. So I, I think most people are acutely aware uh, of the impact of pollution primarily coming from automotive sources. Uh, but I, I would suspect that far fewer um, uh, members of the public are aware of the impact that the shipping industry has uh, on the contribution to global pollution. Is that something you could tell us a little bit more about in, in background? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, shipping is one of the major causes of uh, of climate change and emissions. Uh, we, we, re we reckon that shipping is responsible for about 90% of the world trade uh, and carbon dioxide emissions in particular of the marine fleet reached close to 2 billion tonnes last year, uh, and that's 7% of the global total. So as an industry, it's horrendous, uh, and it, it it gives off more carbon than than many of our uh, our biggest countries uh, that also emit. But uh, it's not just carbon, it's microparticulates from heavy fuel oil, it's uh, NOx, uh, nitrogen dioxides and monoxides, it's sulfur, sulfur monoxides. Uh, it really is a quite horrendous industry and, and we burn heavy fuel oil, at least we have until very recently, heavy fuel oil, which is the worst of all of the distilled fuels. Um, very, very thick and very, very polluting uh, and it's it's generally unregulated. So it's, a, it's not a great industry uh, for environmental uh, reasons. And is it correct to say that heavy fuel oil has a significantly higher sulfur content than what people might understand as, as normal uh, diesel for cars and trucks? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, it's the it's the bottom of the distillation tower. It's the tar at the end of it. We have, it's so gloopy that you have to heat it up before you can burn it because it really is the thick, nasty stuff that no one else wants. And some of these ships built, uh, burn 250 tons of, of this stuff a day. Uh, and when you think that these ships all come into our harbors and they're throwing all of this pollution uh, in, into the sky very close to where all our um, uh, our ports are. It really is quite distressing. Now, there have been changes over the last decade or so. We have introduced legislation to try and clean that up. Um, what most of the big ship operators have done now is introduce scrubber technology on board where they try and clean up the emissions. They still burn the heavy fuel oil, but but they try and clean up the emissions so that we don't um, pollute so much. But But these are really hard to police and you hear these uh, anecdotal stories about ships going under bridges and turning on their scrubbers before they go because that's where the sensors are. So uh, although it's a sticking plaster, it's probably not a sustainable solution. Um, but there has been reg uh, regulation introduced uh, on low, low sulfur fuels and they're 2020 regulations and they have five years to kick in. So um, th there is going to be punishment for um, for those still insisting on burning heavy fuel oil uh, until that uh, hopefully is uh, is no longer available. But at the moment it is and it's cheap. OK, so in, in, in the automotive world, uh, we see a massive move towards the electrification. Uh, perhaps you could maybe uh, you, you could say a few words on the opportunity for electrification and some of the challenges and downsides of that yep. if we apply that to the shipping industry. Absolutely, and and it's it's the same driver. Uh, electricity, particularly if it's uh, green electricity coming from renewable sources, is by far the best way to do this. I mean, just as a as a reference point, we're trying to get rid of the, the sulfur and emissions from cars. Uh, a, a typical car in a year will give off about a hundred grams of sulfur, uh, and a ship will give off about five thousand two hundred tons of sulfur in a year. So uh, the, the big problem, um, but, but we are moving towards this clean green solution of renewable electricity, which has very little carbon footprint ap apart from the, the, the early stage manufacturing of turbines um, uh, and, and pumps. Um, and and we're, we're, we're trying to, to green up our whole um, future. 
Batteries are a fantastic solution on land, at least for some of the vehicles. And it's the same at sea, but but, but batteries come with their own challenges. Um, for one, they're heavy. Uh, and and heavy is the enemy of mass transport or or, or bulk transport. Uh, I, I was uh, reading a report the other day that that talked about electrification of a super yacht, uh, and 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 the the equivalent battery required to to match the power performance of that super yacht was going to cost about five times more than the the yacht itself, but it was going to weigh about nine times more than the yacht ourselves, which is completely impractical. And, and at, at top speed, it was only going to have a range of 24 kilometers. So you can understand that that these big, heavy batteries aren't really a great solution for a lot of our products. Now, if you have a small ferry that goes back and forth and can charge up every time it comes back into port and you have the infrastructure to support that, it's a fantastic solution. It's 95 percent efficient from supply and return, um, but it has its serious limitations, as it does in cars. Um, you see lots and lots of cars electrifying. Uh, you don't see so many trucks electrifying because, again, it's a it's a bulk and weight challenge. Yeah, and the, and the, the range anxiety that, that many electric car drivers feel um, is, is magnified in trucks and, and magnified many times more uh, in ships. I, Exponentially, if your car breaks down because you run out of battery, you open the door, get out and walk away. If your boat breaks down because it runs out of battery, you're pretty much going to end up um, either stuck at sea or washed up on the rocks. Uh, it's not a great scenario uh, and we can't take that risk ever. Uh, so yes. so it is it's it is a solution, but but there will always have to be backups um, to, to that solution. OK, yeah. So if, if batteries don't look and feel like the way forward or, or existing battery technology doesn't look and feel like the way forward for for shipping entering a, a low carbon or a zero carbon phase, what do you think might the uh, alternatives be? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are lots of short term alternatives. Uh, a hybrid seems to be dismissed a little bit in land based transport, but in sea based transport, it's quite a good one because uh, ships will typically run at 50% of your power. So that's in the nice efficient range. Um, but but they they ramp up when they're going into waves and wind and then they ramp down when they're in harbor. Uh, this diesel electric option of having smaller generators consistently putting out 90% of their power and storing excess uh, in batteries which can be yeah. used to supplement. This is a nice efficient solution, particularly at sea. So well, we'll generally move to low sulfur engines with batteries and diesels. But again, that's a very short term. We're still burning fossil fuels. We're still creating emissions. So um, th there's a whole range of zero emission fuels uh, at, at various stages of development. Uh, the one that everyone talks about is, is hydrogen. Uh, yeah. And we're talking about it for land, for trucks, for uh, not so much for cars, but certainly for things like taxis, which can refuel in three minutes rather than plug into a cable for six hours. Um, uh, hydrogen is a real possibility. And, and when we talk about hydrogen, we're talking about green hydrogen now, which is hydrogen that's made from renewable electricity, uh, completely zero emission. You take some electricity, you put it into water, you get hydrogen, you get oxygen. Uh, you take the hydrogen, you put it into a fuel cell and you get water back out again. No emissions at all, no sulfur, no carbon, no nitrogen. It's a lovely story. The downside being at the moment, it's only 35% efficient on a round trip and you're comparing that to the 95% of batteries. So it, it is expensive to use that. Um, if we can somehow make hydrogen with surplus renewable electricity, which is a real option, then yeah. that price comes down because you're effectively using free fuel. Um, okay. So there is there's a nice mix of solutions in this, but hydrogen generally is the building blocks for most of them. Okay. So if, if we were just to, to spend a moment to discuss the um, energy density uh, of the various fuels, um, where does hydrogen fit in the scale against HFO or diesel or petrol, um, and how does that stack up in terms of energy density on a per mass basis compared with a battery? Yeah, and there you, you, you've hit the nail on the head then, and that, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have with hydrogen. The same way that weight is a massive challenge for batteries, hydrogen is big. Um, it takes an awful lot of space to store the equivalent, and it's a, it's a very 
strong, that's a layman's term, fuel, it carries lots of energy per, per kilogram, but a kilogram is absolutely enormous. So what we're finding when we try and put marine hydrogen solutions in place is that two thirds of the vessel is now stored up with hydrogen fuel. It's not heavy, but it is big. Um, so there's a real limitation again to the type of vessel that can can comfortably accommodate this. And most most ships are cargo carriers and you use your cubic meters to carry things that will pay you. You don't want to use your cubic meters to carry fuel because it's a sort of self-defeating prophecy then. So um, as far as power density, it's really hard to beat uh, fossil fuels. Um, I believe that that compressed hydrogen, not liquefied, but compressed hydrogen takes between eight and ten times the volume of the equivalent diesel. Um, which is which is a real problem. So you then end up having to refuel more often, um, or you have to have an awful lot more storage. Refueling more often, uh, that's a solution again for short sea shipping. If you've got a boat that goes out and does its day work and come back to port at night time, like harbor tugs or short sea ferries, this isn't a problem um, because they can come back and, and refuel. But, but if you're looking at a transcontinental uh, freight ship, it is it is going to be a challenge for sure. Yeah, and I guess it would be relatively easy to equate the percentage uh, of fossil fuel burned on day usage compared with um, intercontinental shipping. Yeah, absolutely. And and there have been lots and lots of studies done that, that say that this is all possible. Uh, and I'm grabbing at numbers here, but I think that 80% of the world trade can be carried out with equivalent hydrogen vessels introducing one stop en route. Um, yeah. which would completely greenify it. Now, uh, this doesn't address the commercial implications, the fuel implications, where we're going to get all this electricity to make the hydrogen, none of that. But from a sheer practical s solution, th th there is a way forward and generally we can do that, but we are going to have to make a difference to the way we operate things. Just as you do when you're driving a battery car, you start yeah. looking at your range and planning your trip in advance. It will be the same yeah. with with. Yeah. Okay, Chris, you mentioned a moment ago um, the possibility of using a hydrogen-based fuel cell. Mm -hmm. I'm yep. assuming that there are some, some very much some positives and some negatives associated with that. Yep. Could you give us yep. a bit of detail there? Yeah, I mean, this is the this is the standard solution. When you talk about hydrogen, you generally talk about taking the hydrogen and converting it back through uh, into electricity by intaking air, mixing it with hydrogen, water comes out and electricity comes out. And you use that electricity to power whatever it is you're looking at powering, particularly in the cars, that's how it does it. Uh, marine, no different. You need bigger fuel cells. You need more of these fuel cells. Um, the negative of this, uh, once you get past the hydrogen storage, uh, is that marine is generally a very um, vibration, a strong sector where we have propellers spinning around, we have waves crashing, uh, and these sensitive machines not necessarily um, well tuned to that. Um, we also have to look at the power electronics that come along with this when you're taking this high voltage of power and you're moving it about your boat. You have switchboards that take up a lot of space, they generate a lot of heat. All of this has to be accommodated as well as the fuel storage, uh, but also one that we don't really know the answer to yet because there aren't an awful lot of fuel cells out in the marine world operating. Uh, there's a speculation that the, the salt humid air that's typical at sea is not good for membranes in, in the in the um, in the fuel cells. So the the life cycle that you get on buses that, that we know because we've done millions of hours on buses is not necessarily going to be the same as it currently is in uh, in marine. So uh, there are some unknowns. Now these will be knocked over in the next few years as there are more and more installations going. But but for sure there are some limitations on on marine installations of fuel cells. Okay, and is there any issue with the purity of the hydrogen required for a fuel cell? And, and there's another one, uh, which is why when we talk about hydrogen fuel cells, we almost certainly talk about electrolyzed hydrogen from, from green sources rather than gray hydrogen, which is made from methane. The hydrogen that goes into a fuel cell, 99.999% efficiency, we, uh, the pure. We call it five nines. Um, there have been no impurities. So it's the only the hydrogen that you get out of electrolyzers, which, which make pure hydrogen um, you can use. So the steam methane reformed hydrogen generally comes with a level of impurity that won't allow you to use it in the fuel cells. Well, you can use it, but you will accept that your uh, life cycle of the fuel cell itself will be seriously diminished. So uh, not great practice. Yeah, and I guess uh, that as always, and as, as we see in the automotive industry, 
that there's the educational aspect in terms of the maintenance and the associated engineering, because right now the, the marine sector has many thousands of individuals who are highly capable and qualified to work on diesel and HFO engines as the ship's power plant. But as we introduce the new technology, we need, uh, we need to, to re-educate, retrain and introduce people who are capable of dealing with the hydrogen aspects. Absolutely. Uh, and in the marine sector, you get marine engineers who walk about with a tool belt with hammers and screwdrivers and ratchets uh, and occasionally a stethoscope to, to listen to see where the vibration is. Now, none of that is relevant with fuel cells. These are highly technical machines that will probably require electromechanical engineers uh, with a laptop rather than a guy with a spanner and an oily rag. So there's a huge transition to be made. Uh, fuel cells, again, they're an early technology, so probably at the moment not not as robust as they will be, but we reckon that the fuel cell technology is where batteries were 10 years ago. We're at the beginning of that learning curve. We've got scientists all around the world working at making these more efficient, more yeah. practical, more robust and more affordable. So it's most definitely it's something that's going to happen. But yeah, the, the transition and learning curve to get from where we are now to where we need to be to have a zero emissions future um, is a big transition and it's going to be painful, but necessary. Okay. The, uh, again, just drawing a, a parallel with the automotive industry, uh, legislation uh, is already in place to, to force the um, cessation of manufacture of, of hydrocarbon burning engines in 2030s. Uh, whether that becomes the case or not, I'm not sure, but that's what the legislation indicates at the moment. Uh, is there any such legislation in the pipeline for the shipping industry? I know you, you mentioned um, sulfur reduction through the application of uh, exhaust gas scrubbers, but does it go beyond that? It, it, uh, there, there are lots of plans. Uh, the challenge we have, um, in, again, in the marine world, a, a ship has a life cycle of 25, maybe to 35 years. Um, so you have 25 years worth of assets that aren't yet at their end of life that you would now need to pay to retrofit into a new technology. And this will be cost prohibitive. You can't all of a sudden remove diesel engines or heavy fuel engines or low sulfur engines and say you need to put in a zero emission. We would kill world trade uh, and, and the cost of that would be um, catastrophic. Uh, so we have to do it sensitively in such a way that we develop a technology that's both affordable and reliable that we can then encourage owners to retrofit into their existing fleet without damaging the operations that they have to go in. Yes, yeah. we can insist that all new builds from not now on because we don't have that robust technology. It'll, it's coming. Um, we can introduce that. But but again, that's a 25 year life cycle. If you insist that every new build, uh, it's going to be 2050 before you get through the fleet that's currently in operation. So. It is a big, it is a big problem, and and it's not uh, like a car where you can say no one's coming into our city uh, with a, with a diesel engine. These are international trade that we're talking about. You have to get every country in the world that deals internationally um, with shipping to to both agree to the legislation but support the legislation because I can't have a hydrogen vessel go into a country that doesn't have a hydrogen bunkering station. It, it just won't happen. So this is a big, massive international problem uh, and challenge that we have. So the, the regulation and legislation has to be very, very sensitive to all of these um, areas, uh, which is what makes it slow. OK, yeah. Um, you, you, you've spoken about the use of hydrogen, Chris, in, in terms of fuel cells, but for generations, steam propulsion has been utilised in the marine industry. Is there a way of integrating hydrogen into the steam production and use cycle for propulsion? Uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. And what, what we're saying now is, is hydrogen is fantastic in fuel cells, but there are other ways to use hydrogen. Uh, we typically burn hydrogen uh, has been a way that we've done that. And again, that's not very efficient when you're talking about a, an electrolyzed hydrogen. Um, but we have other solutions of getting that that avoid some of the challenges we talked about with the fuel cells. Um, for one, the retrofit solution that has been used up in, in Orkney on a marine boat where you inject hydrogen into a diesel engine to offset the um, the emissions is a, is a great way of just reducing your footprint when you're in a sensitive area. But, but a bigger step than that, which is replacing your diesel with something that burns hydrogen, and you've touched it there, is steam. Hydrogen mixed with oxygen makes 
high high pressure, high temperature steam, add more water in, you get low temperature, low pressure steam, and that has a huge amount of energy that can turn a turbine. You can get rid of your power electronics, you can drive either directly or you can drive an alternator, um, and it's clean, zero emissions, and you can connect it to an existing propulsion train. So it becomes a really viable retrofit technology. Now, we have a project working with Steamology who have developed one of these um, unique engines, uh, and we hope that this is a, a real opportunity for the marine sector because you can get back to fixing it with a spanner and a screwdriver. The step isn't so big. Uh, you don't need a laptop. It might help. Yes, yeah, but, okay. Yeah. Uh, it still doesn't get away from the issue of the volume requirement for the um, the mass of hydrogen to, to power uh, an international cargo ship, though, does it? That, that, that elephant's still in the room. It, it, it is, uh, and uh, we, we look, we're, we're again, the, the work is going on in all sorts of areas of how you can safely and affordably store it. The, the immediate solutions are, I say low pressure, but, but 350 bar is what we consider low pressure in hydrogen, which is still an incredibly high um, pressure tank, um, which is typically used on buses and will be used on marine. Cars have 700 bars, um, which is really, really high pressure, but you're limited to your size of tank tank then. Um, uh, you can use liquefied hydrogen, which is uh, 10 degrees off absolute zero. Again, you get more power density out of it, but it takes a big old tank. And if you spill it, we have some safety issues that we need to worry yes. about because it'll destroy everything it touches. So that that's the sort of the volumetric side. But but technology is moving into liquid organic hydrogen carriers, um, likes of toluene, which can safely dissolve. Again, I'm using layman's terms because I'm, I'm not a uh, a scientist in that respect, but but can dissolve hydrogen in it uh, to an inert safe compound and we can extract hydrogen out what we want. Now it can carry more hydrogen apparently per, per cubic meter than compression can uh, and it's a nice safe uh, way of doing this. Uh, that's one of many, you get metal hydrides that, that again absorb uh, hydrogen, um, but, but you're also getting manufactured uh, fuels coming off the hydrogen baseline, taking that you can make ammonia. Now we talk an awful lot about ammonia, which is great for putting on the fields all around you, but but also can be used in fuel cells or burnt on board ships. Now it's a poisonous one and it takes more energy to make manufactured ammonia. But again, you can carry far more energy per cubic meter as ammonia than you can as hydrogen. So that's one of the the several solutions that are, that are being put out there uh, as potential potential for international um, transport fuel. Okay, so uh, to, to me as a layman in this in this field then, it sounds like you're you're almost describing some kind of synthetic fuel that, that incorporates hydrogen, if I can put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ammonia, I believe, is NH4. So you have four uh, atoms of hydrogen um, in a in a very small space rather than H two, which is a, a, a much bigger. I think again that's layman's term. We can cut that out of the script. I think. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it does. It carries an awful lot more hydrogen per molecule uh, and you get more molecules in a cubic meter. That's one of them. You take your hydrogen, you mix it with nitrogen and you have this. When you burn it, nitrogen comes off uh, and you're back to, to, to normal. We will also talk about methanol and methane and ethanol can all be fabricated, manufactured, synthesized with hydrogen and carbon dioxide from the air, nitrogen dioxide from the air. Uh, and then when you burn them, that carbon dioxide nitrogen goes back again. So they're considered zero emissions, yeah. even though they do, you use that to, um, to manufacture them. But the problem with all of these, and they have benefits in the likes of power density and storage, um, particularly um, uh, ammonia, which can be stored at minus 10 as a liquid format, so you don't need these high pressure tanks, but they all have their challenges. Ammonia requires an extra 40% of power to manufacture it, methanol even more. Um, so you're again going down that efficiency curve and you're not getting best use out of your 100% electricity that you put in. Um, yeah, yeah, but <clears throat> I guess that ties in quite nicely with your statement earlier of, of the use of excess green energy. Yeah. Um, which we all, we, we've all heard many stories about <clears throat> on certain days. There is so much potential for energy generation from land-based wind turbines and, and sea-based wind turbines that it actually generates more than the grid can absorb. So we, we, we do know that there is an excess on some, in some instances, there's an excess of green energy available. 
Yep, it, it, it's a supply and demand thing. At the moment, we're producing almost, in Scotland in particular, we're producing almost 100% of our daily electricity requirements um, through renewables. That suggests that on some days we're producing 150%, on other days we're producing 50%, which is great, but some days we're still having to burn fossil fuels to, to make that 50%. Now, if we could turn the days that we have an excess into the days that we don't have an excess and balance that flat net curve, not only do we stop paying uh, renewable developers not to make electricity. I think we're up to about uh, two billion pounds of subsidy. Uh, I don't remember where. Well, well for, for sure, last year, 211 million pounds were given to renewable generators not to generate. Uh, what we need to do is take that electricity and do something with it that either stores it for the future um, and we can use it on the days we don't have it. If we can match that supply and demand curve, we can then increase our renewable capacity way beyond the 100% level so that we can then start using fuel to make hydrogen as a process rather than just as a waste process. Um, we have tidal generators, the potential of tidal generators to develop an awful lot of electricity during peak times. They develop nothing during slack times. Yeah. We need something to balance that curve out to make that a viable technology. Hydrogen offers that solution. So th there's a long way to go on this, but there's some real promising bits coming into play that, that will really change the way we look at uh, the route to zero emission. Yeah, just thinking again about the, the adoption of uh, electric vehicles, uh, the marine industry to many people is seen as quite a traditional industry. Um, do, you, do you feel that there are some internal barriers rather than the technological barriers we've discussed? Do you think there are perhaps some internal barriers that are the equivalent of the electric car driver's range anxiety? Absolutely. I mean, if I had a if I had an operating vessel out there that was profitable, and someone told me that I had to change it around, put in this new technology that I don't understand, go into a port that does or doesn't necessarily have the plug connection that I need and the power availability that I need, I would resist immediately and say, "You're not going to do that until you can guarantee me the the price of electricity for the next ten years, um, the the longevity of my batteries or whatever for the next ten yes. years, and the guarantee of supply. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to resist all the way. So that's exactly what we're facing and it's a similar one now we can take control of it in our homes by by building our own uh, or, or getting our installed our own plug you can't do that with a port you, you have to take what's there um so unless you're guaranteed that, that someone's going to be able to fuel your vessel when you need it um it, it generally will will have a, a, a resistance okay that's fine chris just th <clears throat> I, I mentioned earlier that steam propulsion had been around for a very, very long time in the marine industry, but th there are other options around which were, were around before steam propulsion. Um, can you give us uh, some insight into some of the other things? That, the ones I'm aware of are obviously the modern generation of sails, um, Fletner rotors, uh, but it, it, is that something you could perhaps uh, expand on a little bit for us? Yeah, and, and it's a really interesting area. We, we moved away from these things generally because we found fossil fuels that were 100% guaranteed all of the time, except when your engines broke. You never got caught in the doldrums with no wind. Um, we're probably not going to move away from having that backup of a diesel generator. But what we can now use is go technological advancements over the last 10, 15 years in controls, in communications. Every ship is connected to the grid and back to their um, uh, home uh, office where, where control decisions can be made uh, remotely. Um, we have the ability to use this huge amount of information to do things with old technology an awful lot better. The likes of um, optimizing a trip from North America to the UK um, to take advantage of prevailing, prevailing winds and currents, uh, which you can get from weather satellites all the time, uh, deploying a sail that will allow you to offset your diesel burn and get you there just as fast. These these are recent technologies, old technologies that have been made um, really um, viable for new solutions um, without so much cost, and and that's the the, the robotic controls, the the decision making from from processing modern processing power, the communications, all of these allow these to come back in. So sails, both fixed sails and um, uh, and foils, uh, sorry, and, and kites. We've talking about kites, deploying kites when the weather. 
um, is suitable. Um, flattener rotors, which will which will spin with the prevailing wind and either generate power that will supplement your propulsion train or give you thrust uh, in the direction that you're looking for. All, all of these, again, are, are made possible by advances to te technology and this data-driven decision-making that we talk about. Um, uh, and and there, are lots of other, there are lots of other technologies as well that we're developing. I, I said foils there by mistake. Um, the ability to bring a ship out of the water to reduce your wetted surface area uh, and get incredibly efficient uh, transportation. We saw the America's Cup recently, and these boats that can go 45 knots on a 12 knot wind. Uh, this is all new technology, but brought about by structures and control systems that we'd never envisaged 15 years ago um, that are really allowing us to make efficiencies. And it won't be long until you see one of these swimming about in Belfast Harbor as a passenger ferry, a foiling passenger ferry. Again, huge advantages, both in emissions reductions, fuel efficiency, and speed and performance. Yeah, yeah. So if, if we think about rotors and sails and so on, how does that play uh, in terms of retrofit capability, retrofit cost and, and space utilisation compared with the, the, the main drawback of hydrogen as, as a full fuel in terms of storage? Yeah, I think in the first instance, we need to look at emissions reduction. We're never going to get to a zero emissions until we understand where we use our power, what we use our power for, and how we can generally get that power consumption down. That, that's everything from more efficient propellers, more efficient hull forms, more efficient diesel engines, um, but also it's supplementing the power input through any other mechanisms we have. Um, sails, retrofitting a sail on board. Okay, you need a specific type of vessel that has the real estate on the deck, but, but there are lots of container ships out there that have that, that you could deploy uh, uh, remotely so, so that it's a safe operation and you can recover um, this this wind energy to help your propulsion and some of the some of the papers that that are out there saying that you can get between 20 and 30 percent of fuel reductions by deploying three or four sails on the front of your boat when the weather conditions are suitable. Um, uh, this is something we can't turn away from. We have to do this. And, and uh, as you know, Malin have a, a foot in that camp um, working towards a, a prototype solution for a deployable sail on board a, a, a ship. Yeah. So it, 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 if we were to try and, and, and summarize the, the discussion just by simply saying, in, in your professional opinion, if there were five steps that that we needed to take in the marine industry, would you be able to verbalize in brief detail what those five steps might be in your own mind? I, I will start. I'll see if I can get to five, but for sure, the, the, the very... We can go with three if that works. <laughs> yeah. I will do what I can. Um, we first of all need to understand how we use fuel on board a ship. Um, I think most vessels who apply us a, a trade or do some sort of service will have a budget that says every week we'll use 15 tons of diesel and, and that's their baseline if they use more than 15 tons in a particular week they'll blame the weather or or they'll get their engine serviced what they don't know is how much of that 15 tons went to keeping the lights on boiling the kettle or into the propeller uh, and whether um that was impacted by your hull roughness or the growth, uh, all of these things that have an impact to it. So we need to understand exactly how we use our fuel, because if we don't understand it, we can't make it better. Uh, we need to work, that's the first stage. The second one, we need to work collectively as an industry to, to try and encourage these new technologies in a demonstrator form. We need to start having things swimming about with new sails. They may work, they may not work, but if we don't do it, we'll never figure this out. So somehow we need to get a, a favor environment and whether that means government sponsored or government backed or big industry uh, taking a little bit of a punt in this because we have to do this uh, and there is opportunity all around we have to get demonstrators out and about in the sea we have to get the big conversations uh, internationally talking about the damage that we're doing, accepting that this is done by marine damage, and then changing the legislation to to encourage, I'm not going to say force, but to encourage people to start moving in the right direction. Because until the rules start changing, or whether that be carbon offsets or, or, or punishment for giving off too much emissions or subsidizing of clean fuels or some sort of trading scheme, I don't know what the answer is, but we have to have those conversations as well because the whole ecosystem has to change. Uh, the social 
the social pressure of making sure that ports um, and harbors all invest in the infrastructure that will allow the ships then to take that plunge. It has to start with the infrastructure because no one's going to put this new technology on a ship if there's no place to plug it in or wind it up or or fuel it. So we have to start with the land-based systems and and holding them alongside what we're doing already in land-based transport and, and having a port that has a bus refueling hydrogen station on one side, but a boat refueling hydrogen station on the other, even if we don't use it in three years time, someone might move in. Um, yes. And the fifth one, we just need to keep on having conversations like this. We just need to talk all the time and we need to tell people how damaging marine is to our ecosystem. Um, we are breaking the planet and we've got to stop it because the more we talk about this, the more the pressure will grow and the more the first four steps will happen. Yeah. We just got to keep it, on banging it, on. That's an excellent point, Chris, because we, we all walk around in our towns and cities and we see buses and cars and trucks and we understand the damage that they're doing is well publicized. We don't do that on the ocean, do we? No, it's a secret industry. Yeah, these things go out to international waters, and and legislation says this. We register our vessels in places where we know that the the laws are weak. Um, Panama is, has a, a massive fleet of ships registered to it who have never gone anywhere near Panama, just because we know the legislation's there. If a ship pollutes, if there's a wreck, if there's a crash, if there's an oil spill, Panama doesn't take responsibility for it, nor do any of the other flag states. This is out in the big sea, and no one really takes ownership. It's a mucky industry, and it's a murky industry. We don't really know where responsibility lies between ship owners and ship charters and ship operators. We need to tighten this up so that there's clear identified responsibilities and roles across the sector that people can be held accountable for if there is it. And only then will things start to change for us, I think. OK, so just just to wrap up then. Um, where, in your view, does, does Malin fit as an organization in in the role of decarbonizing low carbon zero carbon future for shipping as a leading marine consultancy what does Malin feel it should be doing to promote this i think we can contribute to all five of those points but in the we have lots of clever engineers working very hard at all sorts of things. We have the ability to put demonstrators on vessels of any sort, and that should be where we are with feet on the ground. We should have our technicians deploying these and checking them and measuring them and recommending them. We're not a technology developer. We're not inventing fuel cells, but we can take a fuel cell and make it marine specific and, and get that project out in the water. So we should definitely focus our efforts there. And step five, which is talking about it all the time, doing this sort of exercise, we can have a big impact there. And we can lobby the big decision makers. We can try and encourage the flag states, the classification societies, the international organizations to do this and lend our voice to that big call. Um, there's lots we can do. Our hands are tied because we're just a business, but, but uh, certainly the, there are enough projects out there that we can be pushing forwards um, to make our bit of a difference. Because until we have proven technologies that people can point at and look at and climb over and and uh, and tap we're never going to push this thing forward so that that's yeah. where i see us adding most value to this initiative okay and i, th I think that that final point is absolutely critical in my eyes chris because that tangibility that the ability to touch it and see it and listen to it and watch it work uh, is actually what, what convinces people that there is a future for those alternative technologies I think so. I mean, we're generally a risk averse um, bunch uh, and no one particularly likes going first, but but there's a whole lot of people who wouldn't mind going second and even more who will queue up to go third. So as, as long as we can find those willing to go first, of which Malin hopefully is one, um, then we can maybe set the wheels in motion. OK, Chris, that, that's great. I've thoroughly enjoyed your discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent. No problems at all. And thanks for listening to me. I like being listened to. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Chris. Cheers, Jim. Much appreciated. Thanks, thanks a lot.